Hey, Cypher here. The border between the United States and Mexico is an incredibly contentious subject. It is an unending controversy, but to complain about a problem without understanding it is purely to project one's ignorance. And indeed, that is precisely what most do when they espouse their opinions on the border. But learning some history may alleviate that issue, at least a modicum. Our two countries, the US and Mexico, are connected, but separate. There has never been an all-encompassing nor correct perspective on the matter. For most of the border's existence, tension and cohesion has defined the relationship, governance, and culture along this imaginary boundary. It's bled in both directions, not only through violence, but through interconnection. The history of the US-Mexico border is a long and winding one, much like the border itself. When Mexico gained independence in 1821, they inherited the recently created border between New Spain and the United States. Due to Andrew Jackson taking Florida during the First Seminole War, Secretary of State John Quincy Adams and Spanish Minister Luis de Onís negotiated a treaty in 1819 that formally bought Florida and put a clear line on the map for the remaining border stretching from the Sabine River all the way to the Pacific Ocean, along the 42nd parallel. At the time, there were no settlements anywhere near this line. It was purely indigenous land. But with Mexico's independence, pioneers immediately blazed a trail from St. Louis to Santa Fe to trade with their neighbors who were newly freed from the yoke of Spanish mercantilism. There were already fur trappers who wandered these areas, and they quickly expanded throughout the regions, disregarding the border altogether. Mountain men took part in blazing new trails, such as the dangerously barren trip between New Mexico and Alta California in 1826, which became known as the Old Spanish Trail. By 1832, another trail along the northern border sent emigrants from the east into the Oregon Territory. Some of these pioneers took a southern path to California instead. One tribe that occupied the lands cut by this border was a particular problem for Mexico. Comanches controlled a vast empire across the entire southern Great Plains. They subjugated northern Mexico, regularly raiding deep south as far as Zacatecas at times. Mexico brought empresarios into Texas to create colonies that could populate the frontier and fight Comanche incursions. A massive influx of Americans poured into Texas beginning in 1823. Many were illegal immigrants who refused to comply with Mexican laws. After a decade of that and much internal strife in Mexico, these Texians became one of many departments who rebelled against President Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. Alongside Alta California and the Yucatan, Texas was successful. Since the United States was unwilling to annex them, they created a republic. Texas fared poorly on its own. During the presidential campaign of 1844, candidate James K. Polk pledged to annex Texas. He won, but before his inauguration, the previous president got the annexation done. This left a dispute between Mexico and the United States over whether the Nueces Strip was part of Texas. Indeed, Mexico hadn't acknowledged Texan independence in any manner at all and Polk was determined to induce a war by exacerbating this issue. Sure enough, Mexico fell for it and attacked a U.S. Army detachment within the disputed land, killing 14. Congress declared war, and this would forever change the border. General Kearney managed to bloodlessly take New Mexico and start heading west, though there would be a revolt in Taos a year later. When he arrived in California, he found a revolt had independently blossomed there, and the U.S. Navy aided it without knowing that war was already declared. American forces took over most of Mexico and were able to dictate the terms of peace. Nonetheless, the United States only took New Mexico and California, which included today's Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and Colorado, most of which were entirely indigenous lands devoid of Mexican settlements. 
The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo also awarded a payment of $15 million to Mexico and forgiveness of three and a quarter million of their debts. These new lands seemed mostly barren, taken basically to gain the excellent port of San Diego, and direct territory between there and Texas. But before the treaty had even been signed, Americans discovered gold in California. A survey of the fields took time to get back to Polk, who acknowledged it in late 1848, which ignited a gold rush the following year and reformulated how the states saw this newly acquired land. A crisis over what to do with that land and whether slavery would be permitted there would disunite the states, but not for a decade. Much changed on the border before that happened. As part of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, both countries conducted a survey of the newly established boundary. By 1850, they could tell that the map that the treaty was based on was faulty. In 1848, few Mexicans lived in the section between what was then called El Paso del Norte, but is now called Ciudad Juarez, and the beginning of the Gila River. There were only two settlements remaining there, though the Santa Rita mines had only been abandoned a decade prior, and Doña Ana was just north of this disputed line. The Boundary Commission couldn't agree on where the border was between New Mexico and Chihuahua. A town formed in this region for people moving to Mexico after the border moved, called La Mesilla. Because of the unclear nature of the line, the place became contested with both armies parading through and creating nearby forts. Furthermore, Americans kept trying to take more land with their own private expeditions, called filibusters, because they were pirating land. Jose Carbajal led a series of attacks from Texas starting in 1851, trying to create a smuggler's republic. In 1853, William Walker successfully took Baja California, declaring his own republic, but failed to take Sonora and fled back across the border. On top of filibusters and the whole disputed line, there were also Apache incursions coming from the north. Part of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo stated that the United States was to keep Indians from raiding south of the border, but the peacetime U.S. Army was far too weak to fulfill that part of the bargain. These were clearly problems that needed to be fixed, especially to avoid another war. So ministers met in La Mesilla and worked out more land to be sold to the United States in 1854, with the hope that filibustering would end as a result. The American envoy was James Gadsden, who was keenly focused on the possibility of a railroad taking a southern route. So the Gadsden Purchase gained a significant amount of land south of the Gila River with the specific hope of building a southern transcontinental railroad. Part of that money possibly went directly into President Santa Ana's pocket. That corruption and his repeated failures to stop American incursions led to his overthrow a year later and the beginning of a series of civil wars and liberal laws called La Reforma because it reformulated Mexican society altogether. The Gadsden Purchase also no longer mandated the U.S. to stop Apache and Comanche incursions. But American incursions continued violating the border anyways. A group of Texas Rangers under James Hughes Callahan chased marauding Indians across the Rio Grande in 1855, burning some Mexican towns along the way. A group of settlers under Henry Crabb got invited south into the Mexican frontier, but they were betrayed and massacred. Apaches also kept raiding south. As early as 1849, Chihuahua offered a scout bounty on them, leading to a gang that went renegade along the border, led by John Joel Glanton. The region remained a haven for murderers for decades. In January of 1861, negotiations with the Chiricahua leader Mangus Coloradus failed, leading to open hostilities that would continue off and on into the 1880s. Apaches kept raiding south and sometimes used the Sierra Madre as a refuge from U.S. Army counterattacks. In hopes of fortifying their frontier, Tamaulipas defied the federal government by lowering tariffs and duties for goods coming from Texas. This free trade zone, known as the Zona Libre, expanded up along the border. It was technically smuggling, but the Mexican government was far too weak to crack down. So while all this border violence happened, international cooperation happened at a small scale. There were no restrictions on crossing the border, so anyone could come and go as they pleased so long as they went through customs checkpoints with their goods. 
Hence why there were so many Mexican immigrants during the various mineral rushes of the American Southwest throughout the rest of the 19th century. A wealthy rancher from Matamoros named Juan Cortina was fed up with the Texan mistreatment of Mexicans and he initiated raids northward in 1859 and 1860. He even managed to temporarily take Brownsville and Rio Grande City, but was repulsed both times taking significant casualties. He was the bloodiest of the antebellum filibusterers, and he went the opposite direction of most. All of this fighting over the border played into a deeper issue that tore America apart and would affect Mexico as a consequence. The acquisition of all these new lands kicked off a power struggle in the USA over whether slavery could expand into them. One of the many issues that sparked the Texas Revolution, though not the most immediate, as many mythmakers would have you believe, was resistance to Mexican officials clamping down on slavery leading to a couple armed clashes near Anahuac before their revolution. Texas became a slave state once the Union annexed it. Five years later, California entered as a free state, disturbing the balance of power preserved since the Missouri Compromise and requiring a new compromise in 1850. A compromise of 1850. Compro that granted the territories of the Mexican Cession popular sovereignty in deciding whether they could legalize slavery, something that had been explicitly illegal since the Land Ordinance of 1785. Additionally, the compromise required all states to aid in the capture of runaway slaves, so the compromise was doomed. Both Utah and New Mexico would legalize slavery and numerous further issues inside the United States exacerbated the growing sectional crisis. Many of those filibusters were fighting explicitly for the expansion of slavery, including a large organization called the Knights of the Golden Circle, who hoped to conquer the entirety of Mexico and the Caribbean for slavery. When Abraham Lincoln won the 1860 election because of a Democratic Party split over the issue of slavery's expansion, the South threw a tantrum and declared they'd secede in favor of keeping their peculiar institution of slavery. They even shot first, setting off a civil war that would last for four years. The Confederate States tried to invade westward, taking as far west as Tucson. As such, they got involved in the border troubles, including their own little war with Apaches. Colonel Baylor, the governor of Confederate Arizona, even issued an extermination order and razed a Mexican town because they harbored Apaches. The CSA lost the war, but not before Mexico plunged into a new war because of the American Civil War distracting American foreign policy. Under normal circumstances, Mexico would be off-limits to European powers because of the Monroe Doctrine. But Lincoln couldn't uphold that while he blockaded his own shores to stop Confederate trade. So a European alliance attacked Mexico to collect debts. Napoleon III of France decided to install a new emperor of Mexico, placing Maximilian on the throne through an invasion. Since the liberal reforma government of Benito Juarez opposed the imperialists, conservatives flocked to Maximilian. Confederate Texas even sealed a trade relationship, thereby using the border to bypass the blockade. Cortina raided traders along the Rio Grande in an effort to support the liberal cause, at least until he switched sides for a bit. Liberals used the frontier as a refuge to continue the fight against Maximilian. When Union troops defeated the Confederacy, American generals sent arms and munitions to the liberals who defeated the imperialists in 1867. During Reconstruction, the border was a haven for raiding. Ranches were particularly wealthy during the 1860s and 70s. People would cross the Rio Grande in either direction to steal cattle. These could be Indian, Mexican, or Texan bandits. Cortina himself ran a lot of the bandit raiding from the south, at least until his arrest in 1875. That year, some Texas rangers chased bandits across the border and then got besieged at Las Cuevas. They even defied a U.S. Army order to retreat and slaughtered dozens of Mexicans before leaving. A year later, when Porfirio Diaz overthrew Sebastián Lerdo de Tejada, Lerdistas attacked Texan El Paso and took refuge there. 
The next year, a dispute over the salt trade near El Paso led to a full-scale insurrection. When New Mexicans successfully invaded Texas, unlike Texas who had never successfully invaded New Mexico, huh, and defeated the insurrectionaries when Texas Rangers couldn't, the leaders of the salt insurrection fled across the Rio Grande. Apache Wars continued to traverse the border. California Column troops arrested Mangus Coloradus under a flag of truce and murdered him, leaving his son Cochise to continue the fight. He surrendered in 1872 for a Chiricahua reservation. When Americans consolidated that reservation elsewhere because Apaches kept raiding south into Mexico, another chief named Victorio began another war along the border in 1879, which lasted for 14 months. In 1882, Geronimo led a breakout from the res and began a campaign of terror along the border that lasted for four years. The border became heavily monitored, using a series of heliographs to spot crossings and prevent further massacres. The Mexican and American armies worked together to cross into each other's territory in pursuit of Geronimo. While in pursuit deep into Chihuahua, some Mexican federales mistook U.S. Army troops as Geronimo's band because it was mostly composed of Apache scouts. The federales attacked and killed Captain Emmett Crawford and nearly ignited another war between the countries. With that diverted, Geronimo surrendered in 1886. In constantly dealing with these Apache raids, Sonorans and Chihuahuans had organized much of their culture around defense and militarism, which entailed continuing machismo among them for decades afterward, leading to numerous incidents of violence centering on the borderlands that would ultimately change Mexico. In the midst of all this, towns that were near or even cross the border were created. There'd been an 1850s rancho across from what was later renamed Ciudad Juarez called Franklin, which gained enough population to become a town in 1874. The Southern Pacific came through in 1879, setting off a population boom on both sides of the Rio Grande, with a bridge being built in 1882. Franklin became the Texan town of El Paso. That year, a railroad north from Guaymas to the Southern Pacific made the cross-border town of Nogales. At first, there was no separation along the line, even having a saloon wrapping around a border marker. President Diaz required a 50-foot setback after an 1887 shootout between Arizona and Sonora law enforcement over a prisoner. A couple years later, a joint commission between the USA and Mexico formed to survey and continuously assess the border which continues to this day. A Yaqui attack on Nogales in 1896 brought both sides together in defense, but nonetheless, President McKinley ordered an American setback of 60 feet, leaving a 110 no-touching zone in Nogales. Dealing with these constraints, a California agricultural company created the town of Calexico in 1899, the name symbolizing the symbiotic nature of international commerce there. Its Baja counterpart of Mexicali was founded in 1903, which later became the state capital. Despite the no-touching zone, these border towns and many others like them interwove the national cultures of their citizens. That's why people of northern Mexico are known as Norteños, because they take on much of this borderland culture, which in turn affects the rest of the country just like Southwesterners from California to New Mexico affect ours. Americans invested much into the borderland economy during the Porfiriado, or when President Diaz ruled Mexico for half a century. The Scientifico elite liberalized the ability of international corporations to own mining rights. Copper mining in Arizona, New Mexico, Sonora, and Chihuahua was dominated by American companies. Same with oil in Texas, Tamaulipas, and Veracruz. American companies created Mexico's railroads. Just as there was nothing stopping Mexicans from coming to America, nothing stopped American capital from bolstering the Mexican economy. But this caused resentment, especially among those who disliked Diaz's despotism. I've got an entire episode on Diaz if you want to check that out. Much like how he had launched his coup from Texas in 1875, his opponent would do the same. One of these was Katerina Garza. He was a Tejano journalist who got shot by a U.S. customs inspector and led riots against Texas in 1886, much like Cortina. 
He then turned south three years later in an attempt to overthrow the Porfiriato. He caused much havoc along the border until the American military intervened. Garza made some more raids from Texas, each time easily suppressed by the U.S. Army. In 1906, a strike at the Cananea copper mine became a lightning rod for international issues over the Perfiriado. It was an American mining company in Mexico that paid Americans more and gave them better accommodations in town. Strikers turned to rioting and local ruralas couldn't stop it. Arizonans formed a private expedition to head south and support the corporation until federales could arrive and stop the revolt. 23 people died in the fighting. In response to this, some anarchists led by the Magon brothers formed a secret society of raiders on the American side to foment rebellion against Diaz. Presidents Diaz and Taft met in El Paso and Juarez in 1909. An assassin nearly got to them. He was likely inspired by Magon's writing in the Texan-published Regeneracion newspaper. Taft and Diaz had met to deal with some border issues, since the Rio Grande changed routes every few years because of flooding, something that wouldn't be resolved until 1970. But the near assassination was an indicator of what would come only a year later. Francisco Maduro tried to run against Diaz in the election, but got arrested and had to flee to Texas. In November of 1910, he launched a coup that would succeed after six months of fighting. A decade-long civil war followed that, which took roughly two million lives. The Mexican Revolution of course involved the border. After all, it began by crossing the Rio Grande. By the end of it, the entire U.S.-Mexico border would be completely transformed. Almost instantly, two rebellions against Maduro began. One was led by Magan's liberal army and took Baja with the help of American mercenaries. At Tijuana, bullets crossed the border for the first time, as well as fleeing Maganistas. Pascual Orozco led the other rebellion in northern Mexico. This would be a repeated problem, requiring American soldiers to man the border to keep the revolution from spilling over, sometimes requiring them to intervene. This was the border war, and I can't cover all the craziness of those years. But the Mexican Revolution took more than 700 American lives, most of which were along the border. A terrible 10-day coup in 1913, which an American ambassador named Wilson orchestrated, led to a new dictator, Victoriano Huerta, who would only switch sides at the end of the fighting. These 10 tragic days, or Decena Trajica, killed roughly 5,500 people in Mexico City, including President Madero. As soon as the new President Wilson, no relation to the ambassador, was inaugurated, he fired the ambassador and denounced Huerta. Wilson embargoed all arms to the country, tasking the army with enforcing it. All legal crossings now had to go through ports of entry. The border was no longer open. El Paso officials required border crossers and Mexican prisoners to bathe in gasoline for sanitation purposes, leading to some accidental immolations and a riot. So the closing of the border was itself quite violent. Eventually, an Immigration Act in 1917 cemented this closure by criminalizing crossings outside of entry ports, outlawing contract labor, imposing a head tax, and requiring literacy tests to become an American citizen. Arm smuggling was an extreme problem. Venustiano Carranza launched a rebellion from the border to overthrow Huerta. In the midst of this, President Wilson used a minor scuffle in Tampico to occupy the entire state of Veracruz, causing much consternation and unwarranted bloodshed. Wilson! Texas discovered a man carrying a harebrained manifesto in 1915 called the Plan de San Diego, which called for the extermination of whites and annexation of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California back to Mexico. These Mexican filibusters, called sediciosos, raided across the Rio Grande mostly for the sake of simple banditry. They ended up killing 17 Americans in Texas. In response, Texas rained terror down upon the Hispanic residents of the state. It became known as La Matanza, or the slaughter. 
because of the amount of anti-Hispanic lynchings and massacres. Especially troublesome were the Texas Rangers, who committed numerous atrocities, including entering Mexico and slaughtering a couple of villages. According to one official during an investigation into the killings, Conservatively, 100, maybe 200 Mexicans were killed due to the bandit troubles. In my judgment, 90% of those killed were as innocent as you or I of complicity in these bandit outrages. They had a practice of making blood lists. I have seen a list. No one will deny that they had them. Any Mexican suspected by any man of standing in the valley, or even halfway standing who said, bad Mexican, would be put on a list. It was commonly reported that those Mexicans would disappear. A year after the Plan de San Diego started, Pancho Villa became a problem. When he fought for Carranza, he was an American ally, but he rebelled and believed a conspiracy theory that Carranza was turning Mexico into an American client state. So he attacked a garrison in Columbus, New Mexico, setting off an American punitive expedition led by John Blackjack Pershing deep into Mexico after him. Wilson called up the National Guard to reinforce the border during this time of highest tensions with Mexico. Now, illegal crossings were essentially a death sentence. Pershing returned after much fighting in Mexico without having captured Villa, but successfully having broken the Villaista movement. They wouldn't return until a short-lived rebellion in Juarez that U.S. troops crossed and defeated in 1919. Despite the withdrawal, tensions over the border would bring the United States into a far worse war. Germany sent a preposterous proposal to Mexico that was somewhat reminiscent of the Plan de San Diego. They offered to begin unrestricted submarine warfare while Mexico would supposedly invade north to take back Texas through Arizona. Carranza wasn't falling for such a bizarre scheme, but the unrestricted submarine warfare was enough for the American Congress to declare war on Germany, bringing the United States into World War I. Obviously, that would distract from the border war, but it did not stop the conflict. Just north of the line was Bisbee, Arizona. The mines there used plenty of Mexican labor, and they were paid far worse than American labor. The Western Mining Federation, along with the help of the Wobblies, were trying to organize there and managed to get a strike going, including many Mexican laborers. Because this threatened vital copper during the war effort, Sheriff Harry Wheeler felt justified in taking incredibly harsh measures. His massive posse gathered 1,300 miners and sent them by rail to Columbus, New Mexico, making a clear statement for who held racial power in Arizona. Other events in Arizona along the line would solidify that statement. Yaquis began an uprising in Sonora that killed some Americans as they raided the railroad in late 1917, which obviously increased vigilance along the border. Some Yaquis were trying to smuggle weaponry back across the border and cavalrymen happened upon them. A brief skirmish halted the Yaquis and killed only one, but it was technically the last engagement between the U.S. Army and any tribe. This happened just west of Nogales at Bear Valley. Valley, where Geronimo had caused much havoc a few decades prior. This ongoing Yaqui War increased tensions and meant American soldiers were on high alert to stop illegal border crossings. In Nogales, this resulted in three people killed while they didn't respond to orders to halt before passing an American checkpoint into Sonora. This obviously caused increasing tensions as Sonorans prepared for a fight, which seemed inevitable while Americans feared further German espionage in 1918. Indeed, that came just a few days after the third killing. Another crossing almost had the same result, but the Mexican constable on duty killed the American soldier instead. A general fight commenced with civilians on both sides shooting at each other, hence why it's called the Battle of Ambos Nogales. Ambos just means both. 
You can learn a lot more about that in my dissertation, which has an entire chapter on the topic. When the US cavalry showed up, they crossed and easily stopped the fighting. This was the breaking point in border relations. Within days of the Battle of Ambos Nogales, both Mexico and the United States began erecting a permanent fence in every border town. Part of the Callez Cabell agreement following the battle stated, as a means of preventing border friction in the future, General Cabell recommended that a barbed wire fence two miles long be built at the boundary line, both here, as in Bisbee, and at Nogales. With the fence in place, all persons will have to pass through the international gate. This will do away with ordering persons to halt here and there, which causes misunderstandings. So with this, we can see that the border wall itself began as a practical measure to prevent misunderstandings about the arms embargo. And initially, both sides were pretty happy with it. A month and a half later, World War I was over and American troops could reinforce the border again. By 1920, most border towns west of the Rio Grande had fences. That year, the military phase of the Mexican Revolution would end with three Sonorans leading a coup against Carranza, launched from the border town of Agua Prieta. Plutarco Elias Calles had been the governor of Sonora, and also the person who had agreed to the border wall. Adolfo de la Huerta was currently governor, and General Obregón's house was on International Street in Nogales, so close to the border that some of the fighters during the Battle of Ambos Nogales used it. The ultimate victors of the Mexican Revolution were shaped by the borderland, which had just solidified into a hardened border. De La Huerta attempted a coup in 1923, but an American created the Mexican Air Force, which halted it, and his second laughable attempt got halted in California before he could get across to Tijuana. During Calles's presidency, a civil war over the policy regarding Catholic churches led to arms smuggling and about a quarter million people fleeing across the border. This Cristero War killed another quarter million Mexicans, and tens of thousands died throughout the 1930s with mass lynchings throughout Mexico. When Calles's successor became president, another attempted coup happened on the border, with bombs and bullets ending up on the American side. Suffice it to say, Americans feared further spillover, leading to policies attempting to restrict immigration. Though the right of Mexicans and Americans to become citizens of either country technically had no restrictions after La Reforma, there were many rules that worked to limit it nonetheless. For instance, after the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, some Chinese came to Mexico in the hope of crossing northward, so a small contingent of US federal officers started riding along the border in 1904 to turn them back. During the Border War, a 1917 Immigration Act required any Mexican staying in the United States to be literate in English and pay a small head tax. These were minuscule, but a significant start to restrictions. President Obregón made the next move. Once he had secured power, he halted all American travel into Mexico for almost the entirety of 1921. This was hopefully to stop any coup against his own and the arms smuggling necessary for it, along with fear of American influence. Three years later, the US Congress passed an act that would begin to heavily curtail Mexican immigration by raising the head tax up to $5 or $10 per a crossing, a significant sum in 1924. They also created the Border Patrol to enforce it, collaborating with Texas Rangers who took pride in their massacres during La Matanza. After years of threatening the nationalization of American industries in Mexico, it finally began in the mid-1920s and wouldn't be completed until 1938. With Americans already afraid of Mexican violence spilling over the border and limiting immigration, now they had even more reasons to tighten restrictions, and then the Great Depression began at the end of the decade. The Aliens Act of 29 made crossing outside of ports of entry into a misdemeanor for first-time offenders and a felony on the second. State and local governments in the United States also began deporting Mexicans in massive numbers through various programs. Over half the deportees were actually American citizens. 
Mexicans repatriated during the Depression numbered in the hundreds of thousands, if not a million. Americans saw Mexico as a place mired in civil war and a stubborn refusal to participate in trade, while Mexicans saw the United States as a closed society driven by hatred of them. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt may have called his avoidance of interference in Latin American countries as the good neighbor policy, but in the case of Mexico, both sides simply avoided each other. Borderland communities that were once vibrant centers of cooperation and syncretism were now separate, fortified, and despised. This animosity characterized the border when events outside the hemisphere brought them together and complicated the relationship. World War II drew America and then Mexico in. Though Mexico participated in less combat, they contributed in a way that transformed immigration policy. Due to so many farm laborers leaving to join the fight, America initiated the 1942 Bracero program that brought millions of Mexicans as temporary workers across the border. Migratory labor successfully offset the shortage, but incidentally created dependence. American veterans flourished in the wake of the war, leaving few to return to the fields. So the Bracero program continued long afterward, only concluding in 1964. Migratory labor was lucrative enough that they were willing to risk deportation and imprisonment in order to perform it. This reinvigorated the transnational relationship. Many simply overstayed their visas, or arrived without paying the head tax by avoiding entry ports. This illegal immigration characterized the border, where Mexicans came to America for plentiful and cheap work, but had to violate the law in order to do so, a paradox that persists to this day. The border, residents along it, and Hispanic culture throughout Mexico and America remain interwoven. Migratory labor reinforces that, whether legal or not. Throughout the post-war period, people readily traversed the border legally. It was too late to tear down the fences, but a semblance of transnational cooperation seemed readily apparent again. Since so many Mexicans had criminally entered and remained in the United States, immigration services decided to round them up in a massive sweep and remove them like cattle. Because many had traversed the Rio Grande, a pejorative slur for illegal aliens was wetback. And guess what the operation was called? Yep, Operation Wetback. They initiated over a million returns over the course of 1954. It basically stopped nothing besides chilling border relations again. Mexico had essentially become a one-party state since the revolution, with the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, or PRI, ruling continuously until the year 2000. As such, they had become deeply corrupt. Using grievances such as Operation Wetback, they could play investors and diplomatic favors off of one another and keep migratory labor money flowing south. This kept the border paradox alive, interlinking the sides in a duel of influence, animosity, and cooperation. As the Bracero program came to an end and the civil rights movement gained momentum, these trends would transform the border once again. Through the concerted effort of activists, the 1965 Immigration Act passed. While it halted the head tax that had been so burdensome for crossings, it also imposed the first limit on naturalization for Latinos coming to America. That would become even more restrictive in 1986, though that act did grant amnesty for most illegal immigrants before that year. It also made it employing any newcomers that went outside the quota system federally prosecutable, though that is rarely enforced. These restrictions accidentally incentivized overstaying visas, further entangling the border paradox. Alongside the long-standing anti-Hispanic sentiment that characterized immigration laws since 1924, the Chicano movement arose as a result of this limitation and championed Hispanic cultural and political power in the USA. It faltered and dwindled in the 1970s, but it inspired solidarity across the border. Illegal immigration remains a hotly contested issue, and the sides of this debate were drawn by the Chicano movement. As that wound down, a new problem complicated the border. 
Prior to 1971, America tried to tax narcotics out of existence, but a Supreme Court decision meant having to outlaw them outright. President Nixon declared a war on drugs. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. This will be a worldwide offensive. As cocaine became more popular in the 1970s and a cheaper variant called crack came out about 1980, cartels arose to provide these drugs, often by secretly transporting it across the border, though much came by sea or air as well. These cartels came to control illegal crossings and grew in power as the crack epidemic raged. By the mid-1980s, the war on drugs was a key issue requiring the United States and Mexico to work together on potentially halting cartel activity. This drove crime in both countries, with cartels paying off pre-officials, allowing for numerous secret tunnels into the United States. Tunnel porn? Secret tunnel! Narco gangs like MS-13 in Los Angeles were formed by migrants and quickly became international by working with cartels. This destabilized the border, rendering Mexico completely inept at controlling its side. American drug enforcement and intelligence agents became overzealous, leading to yet another reason for American meddling in Latin American countries a history that would be far too long to recount in this already lengthy episode. The drug war affected borderland culture where cartels and gangs have become romanticized, especially among Norteños and Cholos. It also allowed conservatives to vilify illegal immigrants as drug peddlers. By overstaying visas and avoiding entry ports, they are technically violating the law, but very few are engaged in the drug trade no matter the seeming cultural solidarity with it. A change in the borderland economy would help to further unify the cultures along the line. As neoliberalism became the driving economic policy of the United States and Mexico, one of the key tenets of that ideology is globalization through lowering barriers to trade between countries. Canada and America came to a free trade agreement in 1987. Presidents Bush and Salinas came to an agreement to extend this to Mexico in 1992, which went into effect the first day of 1994, creating the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA. It's the largest free trade zone in the world. While a renegotiated version went into effect in 2020, it still remains largely the same. As a result, a lot of manufacturing jobs in the USA migrated south to take advantage of cheaper Mexican labor, increasing political resentment. When I was in Nogales in 2022, I just saw trains and trains and trains full of cars that were coming from the south to the north. Because Ford was manufacturing in the south and then like doing a little bit of assembly in the north to make it American. Throughout the 1990s, the drug war increased in violence. South and Central American cartels fought Mexican cartels for dominance of the trade. Mexican police and military avoided the conflict and generally stayed aloof, allowing drugs to flow freely northward, especially into California through the mountains east of Tijuana. In 1996, the US Congress passed punitive legislation making all illegal crossings felonious, granted major funding for the Border Patrol, and a separate court system for deportations. President Clinton ordered the border wall to be extended by 14 miles, which local media called the Tortilla Wall. The top plates of it used old metal from Vietnam War era landing pads, thereby uniting the border with that history. This pushed illegal crossings further into the desert, where hundreds of migrants die a year. And that's merely the ones known to the US Border Patrol, revealing how this border wall is imbued with violence. I took this photo from the sidewalk where the US Border Patrol shot from above and killed 16-year-old Jose Rodriguez on the Mexican side in 2012 for supposedly throwing rocks at them during a drug bust. The mural below that 1880s border marker is dedicated to that. Everywhere along the wall, you can find murals and monuments to those who've died because of it. 
After the 9-11 attacks, Americans also became fearful of immigrants using illegal crossings to sneak terrorists into the country. Vigilante groups took to the border to illegally intimidate migrants. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled earlier in 2001 that enforcement couldn't indefinitely detain immigrants, basically requiring them to be processed or released within six months. This and the terrorism concern drove the re-election of George Bush, who pledged to fix the issue in his second term. First, Congress passed the Real ID Act, which strengthened the prerequisites for identification but also further funded the Border Patrol and reworked visas. A year later, Congress funded the erection of 700 further miles of the border fence. That same year, Mexico finally began to crack down on cartels, first in Michoacan. Two years later, Mexican anti-cartel operations spread to the entire country. Violence escalated everywhere, but especially along the border, where cartels struggled to keep their drug smuggling intact. They resorted to intimidation tactics like kidnapping and assassination. While all of this happened, the United States coordinated support for Mexican anti-cartel actions through the Merida Initiative in the hope of securing the border. This drug war continues and often has flare-ups. Deportations from the United States continue to pace, reaching a height in 2012. That year, the U.S. Congress was deadlocked on immigration legislation. So President Obama created the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Policy by executive order, which protected students and their parents from deportation. He tried to expand it a couple years later, but that failed. Donald Trump won the 2016 election by promising to build a wall that Mexico would somehow pay for. Mexico, on the contrary, did no such thing. Uh... I'm not gonna pay for that wall. During his four years, only 50 miles were added to the fence, though he fortified much of the old barriers. Illegal immigration had slowed in the 2010s, but Trump had fear-mongered so much about it that he sought to deter further migrants with harsh policies. Because the Supreme Court had ruled that the detention time for minors was only a few weeks, Trump ordered that families would be separated to hold parents for a maximum time. Over 5,000 kids got separated from their parents. This policy ended in 2018 after much uproar, though another 700 families would get separated and hundreds of kids have yet to be reunited with their parents even today. When the pandemic began in 19... 1920? <laughs> I mean, there was a pandemic in 1920, I guess. I did an episode on that, actually. <laughs> when the pandemic began in 2020, Trump suspended all immigration. The ban only gradually ended, which fully completed in the beginning of 2023. When Biden assumed office, he paused deportations, but only temporarily. The drug trade has destabilized many Latin American countries. Refugees from this violence have been seeking asylum in the United States for over a decade. Mexico aids in trying to set up checkpoints along the way, but large groups end up at the border nonetheless. In crossing legally and requesting asylum, they aren't violating the law, but processing so many people has resulted in major delays so people seek ways around or over the barriers to illegally enter the United States. To folks in this region who are thinking about making that dangerous trek to the United States-Mexico border, do not come, but we as one of our priorities will discourage illegal migration. This is now the political issue of the border how to deal with large refugee groups. And no, refugees do not constitute an invasion. Anyone claiming as much clearly hasn't bothered to learn this history, so their opinion is too bigoted to be relevant. Nonetheless, the substantial influx of people has caused much political turmoil, especially in defining what counts as a refugee or an immigrant. After Republicans refused to broker a deal for legislation on this issue earlier this year, the Biden administration is currently looking to refuse all border crossings, even if they are refugees, due to the high numbers stressing Border Patrol's budget beyond limits. 
although it is important to note that most illegal immigrants within the United States today simply overstayed their visas, which has nothing to do with the border itself. But however we define that border is currently in a state of flux, as it always has been. But as we can see throughout this long and winding history that the border has and will remain a major point of friction, compromise, strife, and interconnectedness. Tensions are nowhere near as bad as they have been, but cohesion is also not optimal. The clear message here is that there is no singular way to conceptualize the border. The line that separates Mexico from America has seen filibusters, wars, unity, freedom, restriction, militarization, smuggling, stealing, sneaking, barrier building, cultural solidarity, cooperation, deportation, and refuge. It's up to the politicians of both sides to decide which of those things they want to emphasize in the future. The border remains a contentious issue, but in order to propose how to solve it, one must first know the history imbued in it. No decision is without context. Hello, King. What are you doing up there? Oh, come on. James K. Polk. <laughs> I knew you'd come eventually. This is almost a record. It's like 10 minutes in and you hadn't interrupted yet. Oh, thank you. You meow, you get picked up. <laughs> well, you actually wanted to be picked up, huh? Look at that. Mwah. Oh, somebody really wanted to be pet. Huh. Yes. Thank you. You're a good boy. Go get it. <laughs> meow. 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 You're getting picked up now. You have anything to say to the camera? Mm -hmm. You got anything to say to the camera? No? You just fall silent as soon as you get picked up? Thank you. Tear. Hey. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So Whoa. Lots of kitty kisses. Yes. Hi. Bounty on. Wow. <laughs> hey. Where? I know you're a happy kitty, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> it's Baja counterfart. Counterfart. <laughs> like a special move. Counterfart. Meow. <laughs> Meow. <laughs> According to. Oh, you want out, don't you? All right. American drug enforcement and intelligence agents became overzealous about cracking down. Cracking down, come on. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's not a good word to use there. <laughs> Dude, stop idling next to my house. 